Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Shadi Arefage. I'm a board-certified surgeon and the owner of Vet Triage. I am quite honored uh, to be part of this symposium. I think this is an amazing feat and a uh, job well done to those putting it together. Plus a shout out to you, Zachary. So uh, we're going to go over uh, my, my career and uh, talk a little bit about the current culture of the veterinary field. It's kind of unavoidable. So we'll go over uh, why and how I became a veterinarian, my background, uh, the birth of veg triage, and then the following are all aspects of the culture that I think folks who are interested in joining the profession should be fully aware of. Not to discourage you, but just to let you know what we are, what challenges we are we are facing, because we do need young, bright minds to to shake things up. So um, I went to high school in Newburgh Free Academy, upstate New York, um, quite quite the ghetto area if you look into Newburgh's history, and. I had two biology teachers, uh, 11th and 12th grade, that really inspired me to have an interest in animals, in genetics. I just love science, love, I love biology because of those two gentlemen. And I thought, you know, boy, maybe I should uh, go into being a biology teacher, or maybe I should be a zoologist, something like that. And at the time, you know, this is this is uh, mid, mid to late 90s, we didn't really have the internet. And so I would go home and look at Encyclopedia Britannica and try to find different careers that revolve around animals. And I realized that zoology isn't really a career that I'm interested in, 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 in doing, but I was, but I still wanted to be involved with animals. And I thought, boy, what if you had the opportunity to combine medicine with animals, not knowing that veterinary medicine was even a thing? So my mom came home one day with an application to Newburgh Veterinary Hospital. And I started there as a volunteer, cleaning cages, walking dogs. And uh, I'd watch the action around me and think, boy, I really hate this. This is not, uh, this is not fun for me. And so um, I was sort of discouraged by it. And then they hired Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike was a new graduate from Ross University in the Caribbean. He'd go there every Wednesday and perform their surgeries. Now, now that I'm a board certified surgeon, I know the procedures he was performing were your basic spay and neuters. But at the time, I had never seen surgery at all, let alone in animals. And I thought that was the most amazing thing. And he would show me how to suture orange peels together. He would let me um, uh, be involved with the operating room, hand him instruments. I felt very cool and I loved what he was doing. And on top of that, Dr. Mike was a, was a triathlon guy. Uh, he's married, had a head of son. He has, had this SUV. I'm like, this guy has his stuff together. This is great. So he became not necessarily a role model, but certainly uh, did inspire me to pursue this further. I thought, well, Dr. Mike is like this. He embodies all these positive qualities. I can, I, I can, I can, I'll have those qualities too if I become a veterinarian. So a bit, bit unconventional story. And so then I, then I got into Cornell University, Dr. Dean Smith, who's, who's passed away now, he was vital in getting me into Cornell. Uh, I did not have the grades that were necessary to get into uh, undergraduate, let alone a, a veterinary school, let alone Cornell, which is the number one veterinary school in the world. And uh, he he taught he told me what I needed to do in order to to get through it. And he was a massive, massive, massive influence on me, and had a lot of pull. And he saw something in me. I met him in person after I didn't get into Cornell the first time, and taught me what I had to do. And the uh, because of him, I reapplied, and then I got in. And since then, just massive thank you to Dean Smith. So I got into Cornell University. And all of my classmates were rock stars, and I was not. And the, the teachers were worried about me because I wasn't really progressing. And I thought, boy, I really hate this. Again, here I am, and I hate this. This is, this is not what I should be doing. Then my friend, Dwight, who's in the picture there with his cat, uh, he, he was one of my best friends in vet school. And I think this might have been like our second or third year. He said, boy, you know, maybe you should consider working as a surgery technician for the surgery department. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do that. You know, he because he was doing it and he loved it. I go in there and I find out you can actually just do surgery. You can be board certified as a surgeon. So back to Dr. Mike from Newburgh Veterinary Hospital. He performed surgeries. I was excited about it. Dwight said, go try the surgery department. I go in there and I find out you can actually just do surgery. You can just do surgery. And so from there, I was reignited once more. And I went to Long Island Veterinary Specials where I completed my residency and became a board certified surgeon. So a bit unconventional story uh, from most folks that I know who've gone to vet school, but the point was to show you that someone who's been doing this for over 16, 17 years now, it does not have to follow the conventional route in order to become a veterinarian. So I graduated from Cornell University in 2006. 
I did my one year general internship in Boston, Massachusetts in 2007. I did two surgical internships, both a year apiece in uh, Long Island veterinary specialists in Long Island, New York, followed by a three year surgery residency at LIVS. And then I, I uh, ended up leaving New York and worked for a specialty hospital in Las Vegas, Nevada, Las Vegas Veterinary Specialty Center. Did not like the culture there. And uh, again, for those who are getting into the profession, any profession, whether it be veterinary medicine or otherwise, if you don't like the culture somewhere, you need to speak up. And we're going to go into that later. So I was there for only about nine months. Then I flew on the country as a locum surgeon, uh, performing procedures in hospitals that wanted to give their veterinary surgeon a break. So I would do that for a few months, followed by running three facilities in the Silicon Valley, Northern California, with the United Veterinary Specialty and Emergency. I was on call 24-7 for a full year. Then I joined True Care for Pets in Los Angeles, where I was uh, um, running the specialty departments and helped get that hospital from nights and weekends to 24-7 emergency facility. I was there for about a year and a half, again, on call 24-7, because when you're trying to ramp up a department or any business, rather, you need to be available. So 24-7 on call again, and then I launched Vet Triage, and that's what I do now full-time. So initially with vet triage, and this will tie deeply into the culture of the, of the veterinary field, again, not to discourage young people, but, to, but to, to let you know that we are facing hard times, but they're fixable, they're fixable challenges. And the key to being to fixing these challenges are you, bright minds who have new ideas, different ethnicities, different cultures. You will bring new, new blood flow to a profession that desperately needs it. So during um, of the past uh, you know, 10 years of my training, I realized the receptionists were taking phone calls at the front desk, maybe 100 calls every day in a 24-hour facility, and clients were calling and saying, hey, I have this problem with my pet. Do I have to come in? And their answer was always the same. If you're concerned, come in. If you're concerned, come in. Well, guess what? That led us to a massive um, uh, influx of pets that needed care because Of course, clients are concerned, so of course they're going to come in. And so that answer wasn't doing it. And as a surgery intern, I thought, you know, what if you had a platform that allowed doctors to triage pet parents over the phone? Because at the time, video wasn't a big deal. Now we all have video. So if your concern come in didn't work, that led to a variety of cultural toxicities in the field because now you have um, uh, facilities that are understaffed, overworked, and the managerial system could not keep up with the demand that was there. They couldn't balance the mental health of their staff with what pet owners needed and still provide exceptional care. So um, during the pandemic, we saw uh, this accelerate because everybody during the pandemic started adopting animals. So now you already had a, a system that was somewhat broken or at least being challenged and then finally broke during the pandemic. And so I decided um, to launch Vet Triage at the end of 2019, but my, the idea of Vet Triage had, had been born around 2007, 2008, and I'd been working on this platform for years before the pandemic. So this was not induced by the pandemic. So if you look at the AVMA, which is the American Veterinary Medical Association, it breaks down the overarching category of telehealth into its different subcategories. So if you look on here, you've got telesupervision, telecommunication, telemedicine, et cetera, uh, vet triage, teletriage, teleadvice. And that is because, A, I think that's most useful right now for the, for the veterinary industry, both on the, cult, on the veterinary side, um, the professional side, as well as the pet owner side. And B, it's because it's currently what the laws allow us to, to do. So when you look at telehealth, it is as you think it is. A, a doctor or, or a service provider, a health provider, communicating with a patient or a client, somebody who needs medical advice virtually, using telecommunication technologies where both folks are located in different geographic areas. And that's that's why we operate. This is just a list of things you need to look out for if you're trying to st- create your own virtual space. And this is a very, very small list. And each one of these bullet points uh, has a lot of a lot of the nuances to them. So the, the goal here was to show you, the, just, just to give you a glimpse of what is entailed in trying to launch a, a platform that has never existed prior to this. We were the first ones to do this. And so we have um, uh, this veterinary client patient relationship, VCPR. And what this is, it's a, it's a guideline, it's a clause, it's a promise, it's a relationship, it's an agreement between the veterinarian, the client, and the patient, which is established at the time of meeting the client and the pet 
in person in a physical exam setting and in, 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 in an exam room setting. And so it, it, that's required in order for you to be able to take care of pets. With vet triage, we are challenging that status quo by saying you can provide excellent medical advice, ethical care for pets virtually. There's no need to meet them in person as long as you know your lane. Our lane is tele-triage, tele-advice. And so we allow to do this uh, 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 with by still honoring the VCPR, the veterinary client patient relationship. So these bullet points you can look at are uh, ways that certain states will try and marry the two worlds of brick and mortar, so the facility, the hospital, and a virtual relationship. When you look at VCPR, you might think, well, why does that even exist? You know, I can call my, my medical doctor and tell them I have a sinus infection and they'll order me antibiotics or call in a script or something. Why is that not allowed in the veterinary field? Well, the argument is that our patients can't speak for themselves. The clients don't really know what they're talking about. And so therefore you cannot establish a VCPR unless you're in person. And the last line there, without prior establishment of this relationship, a veterinarian is unable to provide the appropriate level of care and diagnosis needed. And I wholeheartedly disagree with this. I think that this is absolutely a slap in the face of veterinarians. And those of you who end up entering the field of veterinary medicine, becoming veterinarians, you're going to see how obnoxious that line is. And so to assume that because a veterinarian works in the virtual space, they will all of a sudden forego the ethics that they have um, uh, agreed upon, promised to the community upon graduating from veterinary school, this is a slap in the face. And so we are proving that with our, with our platform. What we what we what we do uh, what we are allowed to uh, perform, and this is why I'm in tele triage tele advice, is an emergency situ situation. An emergency time is of the essence, and and the clients who have a hard time finding veterinary brick and mortars, who don't know where to go for emergencies, they have to drive hours away, or in some cases they have to take a ferry or a plane to get to a veterinary hospital. This happens a lot, and so in an emergency time is of the essence. So when they sign on to vet triage, the pet owner who is concerned with their pet can reach a veterinarian within seconds to minutes, no matter where the client is located to get that emergency care that they need. And it's a phenomenal way of giving them, giving them the peace of mind that they are, are seeking. So right now our current stats were probably over 35,000 sessions now since our launch. We've had pet owners from 15 different countries access us, 35 different animal types, everything from fish, ostrich, kangaroo, squirrel, cow, horse, dog, cat, birds, reptiles, you name it, we've seen it. I've got about 55 doctors on staff, currently both English and Spanish speaking. We've got hundreds of partners. Cornell uses us, University of Minnesota, a variety of rescue organizations like SPCA and Humane Society. We have so many more things we're going to do with this, with this platform to help. So now the challenges. And again, not trying to discourage you, we need folks who are passionate about veterinary medicine or passionate about taking care of animals who also want to take care of people. You know, essentially, you heal the person through healing their animals. And that was actually my vet school essay was that I want to heal people by healing their animals. And that's served me well since and it's still true today. So veterinary school admissions jumped uh, during the pandemic. It's always increasing every year. But during the pandemic, 19% increase. So the veterinary profession grew and adding um, almost 15,000 new doctors to the field. And that, that, that you would think with that, you would say, well, why, why is there a staffing shortage? Well, the staffing shortage is not a, um, it's not an absolute shortage. It's a relative shortage. There are vets out there, plenty of vets. They just don't want to work in the field after they graduate. So the question is why? Suicide race. This is quite well known. Uh, veterinarians are 2.7 times more likely to attempt the non-veterinarians, 7.5% have thought about it, 1.4% have planned it, less than 0.2% attempted. This is way higher than the general public, by the way, and it's tied into an unhealthy psychological status, which is basically a questionnaire. And if you're in the unhealthy psychological status group, you are more likely to consider, plan, attempt, be successful at suicide. So this, so this is really important with mental health. And I do know that millennials and Gen Zs are way more conscientious of this than, uh, than when I was growing up and generations before me. Staff turnover is a massive problem. So not only, not only do you have a large number, number of veterinarians graduating vet school, but they decide they don't want to work for the field because they realize with all the cultural toxicity, um, here are the reasons why you have staff turnover. And so mental health is, of course, number one, as, as, you, as you'd guess. 30% burnout rate for veterinarians. For, for non-veterinarians, 50% burnout rate. That's insane. And our turnover rate in the vet field is 23%, which is almost double the general hospitality industry. 
there's something going on and these are the things that are going on. So work-life balance is a massive, massive problem. And, and uh, you know, there's a way to harmonize these, these two worlds. You don't have to pick and choose one. You don't have to either work all the time or live life all the time. You can marry the two worlds, but there's a healthy way of doing that. And so veterinarians, um, only 40% have a satisfi had a satisfying work-life balance. The general population is over 60%. We're, we're doing great work. We're helping animals and we're helping people through their animals and doing these cool procedures. And yet our work-life balance is terrible. Veterinary dissatisfaction is based on not enjoying the work itself, don't, not finding work invigorating, having conflicts at work, and then student debt, um, uh, low income for veterinarians, stress, cyberbullying. These are, these are not going to be surprising to you, if, especially this day and age where, where, um, where, the, the, where college students, high school students, pre-vet students, veterinarians have the technology at their fingertips. Remember, I didn't have this when we were growing up. This stuff now is well known, and uh, we, we can fix this. We can fix this. So when we look at trying to marry these worlds, I find that with telehealth, I can provide veterinarians with a, a, a professional quality of life that is satisfactory. They can work their own hours, work as much or little as they want. And it's a massive collegial work environment where you can talk to veterinarians who are located all around the world, all different cultures, ethnicities, experiences, demographics. It is ridiculously amazing. And they're so good to each other. And that's natural. They just all help each other out. They're chatting all the time. And that's not me as the owner making them do it. So um, we have barriers to telehealth. And this is why I'm trying to break through those barriers. So I think that although we definitely need veterinarians in brick and mortar, I think that the virtual space can help um, so, uh, some veterinarians who want that kind of work. And we already know that pet owners need it. You know, pet owners are, are well-versed in video teleconferencing. So studies of uh, veterinary students, 92% heard of tele telemedicine through internet and social media. That's a shame because that really should be from veterinary school, not from internet and social media. Um, telemedicine, telemedicine knowledge of veterinary students increases as they get farther along in veterinary school, which makes sense. As you get more comfortable with your basic anatomy, physiology, um, pharmaceuticals, whatever, you start to, your mind opens up to looking at more things. And so something like telemedicine, it seems pretty novel right now, is, uh, is, is, is you can focus on it more as you get later into vet school. And by the way, side note, when, when, when you hear telemedicine, that's a specific branch. Remember the, remember the AVMA branch of all the uh, categories of telehealth? Telemedicine is one branch, but most people use the word telemedicine to be synonymous with telehealth, not the same thing. All telemedicine is telehealth, but not all telehealth is telemedicine. Uh, misdiagnosis, misconceptions. This is a, a, a common argument against telehealth. Like, oh, you're going to miss diseases. You're going to misdiagnose. In human medicine, using telehealth, there's no increased risk of missing a problem with pets. And if you look at the veterinary side, in 2019, a study was published uh, 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 concluding that traditional care veterinarians, those veterinarians that are in brick and mortar, agree with telehealth in over 80% of cases. And I find that as well on our, on our platform. Um, another argument against telehealth is, well, the patients, the patients are client, they can't adapt to it. Well, on human medicine, telemedicine uh, visits were found to be more satisfactory than in person. 2021, over 90% of human patients use a virtual service and found it uh, either satisfying or very satisfying. That's obvious. Everybody here knows how to use video calls. So it's, it's normal now. Back when I was using video calls, it was like Skype and that was it. Um, and, that, and that was okay. But now it's everywhere. Client adaptation in the veterinary field. Okay, fine. Well, the human patient can use telehealth, but you know your pet owners aren't going to know how to use video, which is of course silly. 2018, a study showed that 100% of people were comfortable with the technology. 94% would use a virtual care again. Um, over 80% were comfortable on video, which you know it's weird. Like what, you know what what dog is not comfortable on video? It's a bit odd, but so be it. That's the client perception. It's still good either way. I, 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 either way, 2021. Over 66% reported little to no difficulty, and 45% reported that it took less time. And we find the same thing, too. On our platform, our doctors spend an average of 12 minutes with the client. 12 minutes seems like nothing, but on video, everything's accelerated. You're you're one-on-one -on -one with them. You're in their home. They're in your home, and you are trying to figure out what's going on with their pet. You don't need a lot of time. That being said, our veterinarians all have different uh, communication skills, and so we don't rush the veterinarians either. They can take as little or as much time as they need, as long as the client understands what the veterinarian is talking about, feels like the veterinarian is paying attention to them, they have enough time to look at the pet, then they, they can, that's the natural interaction that occurs.
So here's how I see the veterinary pillars in the field. And here's where I see veterinary telehealth. I imagine the central pillars of our field are the general practitioner, so your regular veterinarian, the specialist, the emergency doctor, and then rescue and shelters. Those are your four rings, your four pillars. In the middle is telehealth. Telehealth can branch all of these all these pillars together. And with, with several hundred partners and over 35,000 cases, we have found that to be true. And so I don't think that these are separate. They are overlapping fields, of course. And I think they can all help each other out and telehealth bridges that gap. With that, if I still have time, I'd like to show you an example video of, uh, of a telehealth session that is pretty standard on, in, our, in, our, in our platform. Hello there. Hi. Hi. I'm Dr. Kara Rainfish. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Erin. Hey, Erin. What do you have going on? Um, so I'm fostering. Well, they were too pregnant. One had her kittens on Friday. Um, the other one. Less than six, six minutes long. There you go. Yep. Um, the other one. So she was fine. And then one of my main cats got under the door and stressed her out a little bit. And then, like, right after that little tiff she had with the, the other mom cat, she started, like, acting a little bit more weird, um, trying to go up to the mom cat. And then she was, like, kept trying to go back to her, and she her attention, she wants more attention now. She's purring pretty rapidly more. Very minimal discharge, so I don't know if she actually is going into labor, but she keeps trying to lay in the bed with the other cat and the kittens. So I'm just... Did maybe the stress just cause something or is she in labor? Do I have anything to worry about? Gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Um, how old is this one? Um, honestly, I have no idea. We got them from, this is going to be this cat's third litter. Okay. So, that was my, that was my next question. How many litters this one had? Okay. So this is, this is the third litter. Very good. And do you know um, approximately when she, mm, I guess, how long she's been pregnant for? Um. Probably around the same time. So like, I really don't know. I got them when they were already pretty pregnant. So I only have, I've only had them for about three weeks now. Okay. She's not as poofed out as the other one was right before she gave birth. So maybe she's just a smaller uh, litter and her nipples are still, yeah. you know, like and then still. My, my mother, how many babies are in there? Has anyone taken x-rays? No, no, this has completely been home stuff. Gotcha. I feel maybe like three, but sometimes it's hard to tell. For sure. Uh, let me look at her. Let me see. If you were to pick her up and then like put her on the, on the bed, can I? Can you do that and then kind of watch what she does? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me that I want to see. Sure. No. Boo boo. Let's see what she's doing here. Any medication, medications or supplements? No, she's not on anything. She's on kitten food and then wet food once in the morning, once at night. So she went back to her bed, but earlier she just kept trying to go back to this cat and her uh -huh. kittens right there. Gotcha. So now she seems to be going back to here. So now I'm thinking she's in labor, but she really doesn't have a lot of discharge. Yeah. She has well, some, but not a whole lot. No, I, but here's the thing. I, I agree with you. I mean, the nesting... The, the neediness um i i think that's all i think she's i think she is if not in labor going to going to be in labor tonight okay that's the yeah this is this is fairly so what i would actually think of doing um if you're okay with it is just minimize stress in the room maybe dim the lights kind of give her her own space let her do her thing you know watch her from from a distance and see and see what she does have food and water available for her and see what she does Okay, and then I guess my next question is, so originally me and my sister were going to like each take one of the cats. So if she does take this one, it would obviously have to be after she's we, she's had the kids, right? Because we don't want to stress her before she yeah. has them. I, I think so. I think, it's a, I think it's a smart idea. Whatever we can do to minimize stress in this cat's life. because uh, She's having ooh. contractions. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, um, yeah let, her, let her do her thing. Okay, so then... Um, after she has the kittens, what's like a good time frame that she could be moved with them? I just don't want any stress for the other mom, and I don't want continued stress for her. Um, so, they're okay for the most part, but the so the, the easy answer is no one knows that, right? But I will tell you that 
as a board certified surgeon and having done plenty of C-sections, dogs and cats, I will say that the second day, they, uh, the surgery is done, the mom's awake, the kittens are awake, the kittens are nursing, mom is good. But I send them the hell home, like they go. So, so, and it's literally hours after surgery, hours after giving birth with a C-section. So I would say the second the kittens are out and they're nursing, mom is good, move them whenever you want. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's it. I mean, she might just have a slower, slower labor than the other one did, but... Mm -hmm. This. let's do this because it's still early in the night um i'm going to email you and, and i'm, I'm going to i'm just gonna send you a blank email i'm gonna send you a blank email that way if you have any updates for me if you want to send me pictures or videos and say hey doc it's been three hours here's what's going on so far what do you think or whatever or or you may not need me but um let me at least send you a blank email and that way you can at least have access to me beyond the, beyond this video session so we can make sure things are good with mom here okay all right i appreciate that my pleasure, of course. But yeah, I think I think you're on the right track. I, I would say dim the lights, let her okay. chill. Um, and that's that's and I, I don't know if having the other mom and the kids in the room are is more stressful or more relaxing. It's kind of your your judgment call. Yeah, I mean, the only other option would be to have her give birth in my room away from the other cats that are in my house and then her, but then I'm not sure if that new environment would also make it just more stressful for her because there's a bunch of new smells. The other cat's smells are predominant there because they sleep with me. Then, yeah, whatever it is least new, I would say, is okay, the way. Okay, so just keep her in here and keep an eye on her. Yep, yep, that's fine. Just in the lights a little bit and keep things kind of chill. Okay, all right. Well, I appreciate your help. Of course, my pleasure. I will send you a blank email here. And we'll get you and just keep me updated if you want to. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And so a few hours later, I get an email with a happy mom and some kittens. And so this is why that last bullet point that I said it was a slap in the face is, is a ridiculous thing to say because we offer services like this thousands of times a month. And um, clients, a client like that would have driven to the emergency room with a, with a mom who's stressed out for being in labor, who's moments away from being in labor. That would have been a useless uh, visit, both financially and stress and time-wise, when, when instead you could talk to a veterinarian who's experienced over video and get, get an answer and, and have a good outcome. So um, the, 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 the idea here was this. Uh, it, it, I, I want you to uh, keep that passion you have for the veterinary field. Think outside the box challenge the system. We were the first ones to do virtual care, and yet nobody nobody has matched us yet. And that's, they came out of a need. And I took my entire life's training as a board-certified surgeon who didn't even find veterinary medicine enjoyable every time I tried. Um, I took that and all that training, most of my adulthood and transitioned over to the virtual world, challenging the status quo and realizing that this platform cannot just help pet owners, but help the veterinary community, veterinary professionals with all the cultural problems that I laid out. So go out there, use your um, your uh, your minds and your hearts to improve a profession that is absolutely fantastic, but it needs your help. So this is, this is all my content information. For anybody who's interested, I want to thank um, a VIP for allowing me 